Every profession struggles with competing priorities, but the stakes are never as high as they are in healthcare. For example, how great is the risk that we will build models that focus so intensely on the person that we reduce the capacity to provide care for the larger population? Our next panel of speakers will look into the, world, the work being done at the Precision Mention Precision Medicine Initiative, and along the way, we'll touch on data, privacy, and, court, and of course, outcomes. Um, let's welcome our next panel. How can we transform health with precision health? And if you're following along in the program, you're going to note that we have a pinch hitter today um, to, to stay with uh, Dr. Zucker's earlier reference about the Red Sox. I'm not going to I'm not going to draw any more on my knowledge of the Red Sox, but uh, we have Dr. Robert Green, who's going to be pinch hitting for Elizabeth Baca. Dr. Green is a medical geneticist and physician scientist. He directs the Genomes to People Research Program in Translational Genomics and Health Outcomes at the Division of Genetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital and at Harvard Medical School. So thank you for pinch hitting, and uh, we, won't, we won't even notice. Great. that Dr. Baca couldn't Very join good. us. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. And thanks for attending this wedged between a lecture on food and your actual lunch. I could see you getting very hangry at, at us. Did you know that there is actually a genetic markers for the ability to get hangry? Yes, so, so genetics pertains to almost everything. But look, you can't go, yeah, thank you. I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> You can't go anywhere without running into a conference on precision medicine and personalized medicine and individualized medicine. And there are so many different components and angles of that. We're bound to disappoint you in this one with, with only three people. But uh, we are nonetheless going to attack this from three really different points of view. And I hope you'll find it interesting. And of course, all roads lead to the question of how do we use precision medicine to give the right treatment at the right time to the right person, and ideally, to prevent disease and create a true healthcare system rather than simply reacting to disease in our current sick care system. So it's my pleasure to moderate and give a few remarks in today's session. Um, we'll have three speakers. Each of us will speak for somewhere between five and seven minutes. Uh, you already had a little intro from me, so please, if, as you start, would each of you please just say a word about yourselves before you make your remarks. Our remarks are not particularly themed around any specific theme, but we'll find ways to weave them together. And then we're definitely going to leave time for you to make comments and ask questions. So get those ready and think about what those are going to be. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Ernst uh, Berndt who is Professor of Applied Economics at MIT Sloan. Professor Burns. Thank you. Um, I've been involved for the last decade or so in designing clinical trials and thinking about the issue of how do you develop a precision medicine? What are some of the statistical, economic, and ethical sort of implications that seemingly arise from a situation when you would think they wouldn't? That is to say, it's just a scientific examination, isn't it? So let me go to the next slide, please. Oh, you want me to take that one? Good, thank you. Uh, by way of introduction, we all know that uh, there are differential responses to medicine. Uh, suppose that we have a panel of patients that's on the left side of the, your screen there, and the blue ones are the ones who respond and the black ones are the ones who won't. What we would like to do is to figure out ahead of time who are the responders likely to be and who are the non-responders likely to be. And we do that for two reasons. One, we'd like to enrich the patient population so it would be more likely just responders. And second, and consistent with the Hippocratic Oath, we don't want to do harm. And so we'd like to avoid the side effects uh, from the non-responders, it may, by giving them a drug to which they don't respond, it may delay their access to effective treatment. And so for both reasons, uh, we'd like to be able to distinguish the responders from the non-responders. Now, the notion of precision medicine uh, 
Some people call it personalized, some people call it stratified, some people call it tailored, but it all rests on the basic idea that you have the ability ex ante reliably to distinguish responders from non-responders. Uh, how do you do that? Well, it's typically implemented by taking a companion diagnostic, and you take a test score from that companion diagnostic, and you say, if the test score is above a certain cutoff value, we think it's highly likely that person will be a responder. And if the test score from the companion diagnostic is less than the cutoff value, then we think it's uh, quite likely to be a non-responder. Uh, but like drugs, companion diagnostics are not perfect. Precision medicine has imprecise aspects to it. Uh, as a result, as I want to give you an example now, the choice of this cutoff value is really a critical one. It's not just a clinical, scientific, statistical decision. It's actually one that has very significant economic and ethical implications. Consider the following example. Uh, Say we have three uh, drugs that uh, all treat the same condition. Uh, they're subjected to clinical trials. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, they all have the same distribution of response relative to the test score. On the horizontal axis here, I have the companion diagnostic score uh, with a larger number uh, to the right, uh, and on the vertical axis is the number of patients. The light blue curve tells you the responders, and they tend to have higher test scores. The yellow folks are the folks who have the lower test scores and likely to be not responding. We have some potential cutoff values. Uh, suppose, for example, well, the first thing to notice is that these two curves overlap. Uh, so that there are some folks in the blue part who overlap with the yellow part. And in the clinical design literature, we call those false positives and false negatives. Uh, suppose that we use the cutoff A and said that uh, we're going to submit this drug to the FDA. We've got this distribution of responders and non-responders in the treatment arm. And we're going to say that uh, anyone who has a cutoff value above A is eligible to get the drug. Uh, notice here that if we use cutoff A, uh, we perfectly predict everyone who will respond. The blue curve is entirely to the right of the cutoff value A. Uh, but there's a lot of non-responders, the yellow, who are, are above that cutoff value. Those people will be sold the drug. That'll be revenues for the developer and yet they won't respond, and we deny them access to timely treatment. So that raises some really important issues. Uh, alternatively, suppose that we chose cutoff C. Notice that with cutoff C, uh, we would, everyone who got the drug would basically be a responder. Uh, so we would have a very rich patient pool. With such a highly effective drug, you could probably get a premium price for it. Witness what we saw with the hepatitis C drugs uh, for $90,000 for an episode of treatment. So what you do with cutoff C is you probably have a very enriched patient base. You can charge a premium price, but for a smaller number of people. And notice that if with cutoff C, that whole set of yellow folks to the left of cutoff C uh, is denied treatment. That raises uh, ethical issues as well. Now, what we might do is say, let's do a, something like a cutoff B. Uh, and that's sort of in between. Notice that we probably uh, have a larger population than we would have at cutoff C, a smaller than at cutoff A. You could probably charge a price somewhere in between that from cutoff A and C. Uh, but how do we choose that? The in interesting point that I'd like to emphasize that those three different choices are all with the same distribution, which is submitted to the FDA. Uh, what's put on the market uh, is a choice of the developer, but has enormous 
not just statistical and scientific implications, but also economic and ethical ones. So let me conclude. Seemingly objective, clinical, or statistical decisions on the choice of a precision medicine cutoff value inherently has economic implications. Uh, some of you are medical professionals, others of you are just MBAs. Uh, for precision medicine to succeed, the common adage of leave drug development just up to the scientists and don't involve the commercial folks is simply not going to be possible with precision medicine. The choices are inherently economic and uh, ethical, not just scientific. And that raises, I think, a very interesting question for this audience, is how do we responsibly develop precision medicines? Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Uh, so keep your questions today, but, but may I just follow up with one question that, uh, since I have you captive here. Um, the whole notion of precision medicine comes down to the idea that two people have subtle differences, sometimes multivariable differences, that distinguish them in terms of their responsiveness. But the entire precept of science, particularly randomized clinical trials, involves groups of people. Uh, at what point does trying to tailor precision medicine almost down to the individual conflict with the notion of science itself so that there is no control for a human being who is at heart uniquely different than another human being? And where does precision medicine turn into anecdote and even farther into pseudoscience? Uh, that's a statistical issue, <laughs> it's a statistic. uh, and, but a very profound one, I might add. And in, uh, where we run into it already, I happen to be a, an uncompensated employee of the FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration. Where we run into it a lot is with orphan diseases, uh, because orphan diseases have very small populations. How finely can you disaggregate a tumor type into how many different orphan diseases that would have a, and this, this is a, not just a statistical issue, but it raises very profound uh, issues at, at science. So I, I can't really answer your question, Dr. Reed. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, let's go on to our next speaker. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Dominic for a long time. Dominic Bertelli is a partner in Putnam Associates. I just tell people just a, a line or two about what you do, because uh, I really don't have any idea. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then give your remarks, thanks. Okay. Um, and I'm very interested in, in dialogue with the audience, too, so I'll be brief in my remarks, and I think Robert has some, some things he wants to say, too. Um, I support um, biopharma mostly on drug development. I've worked across a lot of different therapeutic areas. I've worked on gene therapies and CAR-T, and my role is not to be the clinician, but really to help with a lot of the commercialization issues, so helping to figure out where there's unmet medical need, helping to figure out what populations to try and include in a trial. Um, and recently, I've been doing a lot of work on biosimilars, too, and have a lot of perspectives about um, how we've done biosimilars right and wrong. Um, but with, with those as a few points of background, I figured um, I would try and make, you know, introduce one potentially controversial philosophical point and then maybe try and throw out one, you know, concrete, interesting idea to, to mix it up. Um, on the philosophical point, I think in a lot of discussions around precision medicine I've heard lately, there seems to be an intuitive, inherent juxtaposition of precision medicine being antithetical to broader public health agendas, which to me it seems dangerous and not really accurate. I think if you're looking at broad public health and where you can find the resources to do that better, sure you could go and argue that the drug that is priced at 80,000, 90,000 per episode of treatment, you should reduce that dramatically, but you could also go and you know, I, I think, um, are you a cardiologist too, besides a geneticist? Well, um, you can look, there, there are articles out there that argue that the $100 billion we invested in statins was all wasted, if you really look at outcomes. You can find examples where they spent $8 billion putting pacemakers into people who are functionally demented. There, there's just immense amounts of waste in the system. And um, to me, to, to target Things like, I work a lot on CAR T therapies, where you take T cells out, you do gene therapy on the T cells to train those T cells to go get a cancer, put them back in. And for a lot of people, that saves their life. It's their last lifeline. These therapies cost $400,000 a year. The thing that needs to be appreciated about that, that is a lot of money, but it costs a lot to develop that therapy. 
And if it works the way it should work in you know, 10 to 20 years, that therapy, the price of it comes way down. Just as in the case of Harvoni and Savaldi, um, it launched at a huge price point, but then you had two follow-ons come out. And so even though the list price is now quite high, the rebates on the back end are about 60 to 70%. So the actual cost of those drugs is now way below where they were. And within five, 10 years, those will be generic. So a course of therapy will cost $50. And if you didn't have those incentives in the first place to develop these drugs, you would never get these medicines in the first place. So I just think we should be cautious about um, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and, and looking at some of these cutting edge therapies because the super expensive cutting edge therapy today might be the much cheaper standard of care in 20 or 30 years. And with respect to CAR-Ts in particular, if you didn't do these super expensive, personalized, customized ones, you wouldn't have the bridge to get to the ones that might be off the shelf, which you can argue ought to be a lot cheaper or a lot sooner. Um, so that's sort of one philosophical, and maybe there's disagreement, we, we can mix it up on that. With respect to just a concrete idea that I think the time may have come, um, in work on oncology, I, outcomes are very clearly related. There's a great drug called Gleevec that um, basically it cures about half people of chronic myeloid leukemia. The other half, it can sustain them, you know, if they keep taking the pill for long periods of time, but half can actually stop. And they've known for 15, 20 years that one of the key predictors of if the drug's gonna work or not is the blood level. And it turns out that some people are fast metabolizers and some people are slow metabolizers. And if you're a fast metabolizer, if you don't go to a higher dose, your blood level won't be high enough and your disease will probably advance. This is a level of complexity, and you know, that's one part of it. A second part of it is there are three drugs that are sort of similar, um, some of which have drug-drug interactions with other types of drugs. And so just in terms of the broader public health, I think in 10 years ago, this was way too complicated to get into. You can't worry about what someone's P450 system is like. You can't really look across a bunch of the, the different um, drugs they're taking and try and come up with the rationale of, of making a subtle switch. But now with our information systems, this actually could be a pretty important place, right? You know, at the margins, you know, I did a claims data analysis and found about 15% of patients run on antidepressant they shouldn't be on given the TKI that we're taking. And nobody's asking this question, nobody's dealing with it, but that's leading to bad outcomes. And it seems to me in the era of informatics, that's the sort of problem that we ought to maybe be able to fix. So with those, those brief yeah. remarks, yeah. thank you. That's terrific, thank you. Dominic, is there, is there a catch-22 in the sense that uh, so many of the reimbursers, the claims of the payers, want clear clinical evidence of efficacy, medical relevance, action, changing course, something like that, but they won't reimburse to get these things into the mainstream of medicine so those actual data can be collected? I, I certainly feel that in genomics. Is it, is it true in other areas as well? well I think real-world data is creating opportunities to do better. But one of the dilemmas in cancer, for instance, you look at PD-1s, which maybe Professor Burnt has worked on, um, when they put their label out, they actually did put out the sort of distributions you're talking about. So a physician can basically look at the likelihood of their patient to respond based on the pdl one expression. But what's interesting about that is patients evolve over time, and their pdl one expression may go way up at a certain point when the tumor gets hot. So the time at which that test is taken also determines whether, you know, what the patient's attribute is, because especially where a lot of precision medicine has been in cancer, the disease continues to evolve. And that's just another factor that confounds and makes it that much harder to figure out who to put into the trial and who to treat in the trial. Um, I guess the whole trend toward value-based agreements is only going to get more dramatic. The um, conversation I was having this morning was about how to help a bunch of, uh, of payers and healthcare systems um, do that more extensively. And the whole idea of a value-based agreement is that you only pay for the patients where the drug works. Um, and that's another place where informatics is really enabling a whole different type of dialogue. And um, I think you'll see a lot more of those agreements. But then what you're going to see is a really stratified healthcare system because you'll have the top 25% of sophisticated plans, which often have the, the patients who are bigger corporations and you know, the higher income strata, whatever, will be in those sorts of arrangements. And at the other end, you'll have plans that are not sophisticated enough to do that sort of thing. And um, I don't know how you make that equitable. Wow. And that's in addition to the stratification that's going on according to people's wealth right now, yeah. where they can pay out of pocket and get all sorts of different care, uh, both 
positively and negatively, depending on the, on that. And and where, Professor Ernst, where you where you draw that line really is going to be critically interesting in value based treatment, right? right? Yes. How, how will that? How do you think people will try to game the system with, with your line? Um, actually, it's interesting you use the word game because uh, I think game theory has a lot to add to this discussion. And in fact, I think if you look at sort of the incentives that have been faced by drug companies, what we see happening is more and more they're going to a higher efficacy drug, higher cutoff value because of the higher price. Right. And it's almost a prisoner's dilemma sort of outcome. They would prefer to be at a cutoff like B, but because of the competitors, they're, they're all going to be at C. Right. And, uh, and I think that helps explain why, in fact, uh, what we see in the last five, 10 years is uh, a movement toward uh, very high response rates uh, for small population drugs, but you can charge a very high price. Wow, that's really interesting. All right, if I can take the clicker. I'll give, uh, I'll give my remarks. And um, mine are focused on genomics, but I think you can, you know, genomics has been kind of the, um, uh, one might say, the tip of the spear for precision and personalized medicine. But uh, I recognize, and all of us recognize, that there's far more than that to this. There's the cancer treatment. There's treatments in general. There's all sorts of quantified movements, sorts of situations. Um, there's wearables. There's all the things that Howard talked about in his keynote address. So. Uh, take this more as, as just one slice of the pie. Uh, but uh, I would also ask as we start out, how many of you have had a commercial genetic test or screening genetic test of any kind, 23 or me? Okay, how many of you have actually had your whole genome sequenced? Okay, very few. All right, just uh, Mr. Wall and I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> me too. And you, and you, that's right. Um, all right, so I titled this talk for you guys, The New Science of Public Health Genomics, because, and the transformative power of data, because one of the things I'm worried about is whether commercial entities are really going to drown out, have voices that are so loud that they drown out the call for data. Um, so just I, as I always do, just please note my uh, potential conflicts of interest whenever I talk. Um, we're talking about the promise of precision medicine and the movement to healthcare, not sick care. And you might ask, at this point in time, with, when let's just say genome sequencing, as example, has dropped so that it's less than $1,000, why isn't it being used in preventive care? Why isn't everyone in this room, besides the three of us, why haven't all of you had your genome sequenced by your doctor, with your doctor saying, OK, and we're going to look for these things. We're going to help you out with these things. Why is that? And the reasons are in my view, because we're the only branch of medicine that's absolutely terrified of our own technology. We've had this notion that genetic information is toxic. We've had this notion that there's too much information there to possibly manage. We've had this notion that participants or patients or even their providers will completely misunderstand it and act on it in nefarious or damaging ways. And we definitely have this notion that the harms and costs will outweigh the potential benefits. And so uh, my entire career has been dedicated to a series of research studies which have examined these propositions with empirical data. This study, uh, giving back APOE for Alzheimer's disease, this study, the first to look at customers of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, this is the first randomized trial of adults who have whole genome sequencing. The BabySeq project, our newest one, is the first randomized trial to use genome sequencing in newborn babies, healthy newborn babies, extremely controversial. And we're following um, people who have had sequencing. So I've, I've asked to enroll you in my research study today. I'm always recruiting. And, um, and then the MILSEQ project, the very first study to look at sequencing in the active duty military, which brings all sorts of interesting occupational and potentially bias and even security issues to bear. But today, I'm just going to ask, have to give you a quick overview. What are the medical, behavioral, and economic outcomes associated with what you could learn if you got sequenced today? And our project that I'm going to concentrate on is the MedSeq project, the first randomized trial of whole genome sequencing. You could have enrolled in this. We'd have taken half the room, and we'd have said, we're going to get you a whole genome sequence. We'd have taken the other half of the room. We're going to say, sorry. You didn't get randomized to that. We're going to give you some family history, and then we're going to 
follow you exactly the same way and see what happens. And first of all, we had to ask, can we manage this amount of information? And could the providers actually understand it? And we do believe we took a year or two and we solved those problems with a brief amount of education for primary care doctors and a one-page summary of everything of value in your whole genome. I'm happy to share that with you. But the real question is, did we find anything useful? Would this half of the room get something that would benefit them that you would miss on this half of the room? And I think I can answer that the answer is yes. We found that 92% of people, when you looked as deeply as we looked, not just with a couple genes, but with all known disease-associated genes, were carrying recessive carrier traits that would be important in your reproductive planning or the reproductive planning of your children. And we found that a startling 20% of people were walking around with a Mendelian, a single gene mutation that puts them at risk for a future cancer, a future heart disease, or a future disease of some other kind. Moreover, we looked at polygenic risks, which are the common genes that put together risks for heart disease, diabetes, and so forth. And we could identify, a lot of people, it's just a mix, mishmash. You got you know, 50 genes putting you at risk and 50 genes that you know, protect you. But there's a tail, a long tail of this. And about 10 to 20% of you will be on that long tail where you're at really elevated risk for heart disease, diabetes, and atrial fibrillation, other common diseases. So we're able to put this all together and I believe give back people useful information. So the other question that comes up, just again, a quick preview, is would this half of the room have much, much higher healthcare costs because of all this extraneous information? And would it be really not worth what they'd spend on it? And just one slide of many analyses we're doing now, which starts to suggest that in our randomized trial, which is really the only fair way to look at this because of the bias inherent in the people who would volunteer to get this kind of information there, health seekers, their information seekers, is that at least in six months, there was no difference between the whole genome sequencing group and the control group in terms of medical costs after sequencing. So we're following this out further. We're following this in babies. We're following this in the military. But um, the BabySeq study has really captured people's imagination because Francis Collins and others have been asking for over a decade, are we there yet? Are we at the point? where all of your newborn babies, it's going to be just as common as that heel stick test that looks biochemically for stuff. And so I think the question is, uh, if you are having more babies, or your children are having babies, or anybody in your orbit are having babies, uh, will those babies, how soon will those babies be fully sequenced to predict and prevent disease? So to end up, I just want to say that um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting resistance to novel technologies. And sometimes that resistance comes from medicine. Sometimes it comes from the very specialty out of which that novelty is arising. And medical geneticists, my brethren, are the most resistant to this of anybody you will find. It's really fascinating. But I do believe this is going to change, that more than 90% of us are carrying critically important recessive carrier traits. Over 80% of us are carrying atypical pharmacogenomic uh, variants. 18 to 20% of us are carrying monogenic disease traits, which may manifest at some point in time. And 20% of us times, oh, four, five, six different polygenic common conditions are in the top quintile of risk, putting us at four to five times the risk of the person sitting beside you. So there's going to be plenty for your doctor to work with. So that's, uh, th those are my remarks. And I would alert you in a, in a uh, completely self-serving um, ad. I would let you know that we are soft launching our new Boston Preventive Genomics Clinic at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And if you are interested in paying out of pocket, not, not to us, but to the lab, uh, <laughs> to, get your, to get your sequence done, uh, we'd welcome your inquiry about that. So uh, that, that's, those are my, my remarks. Thanks. All right, so now we've successfully gotten through our, our remarks. Would you all have any comments about my talk or each other's talk before we open it up to the audience? Does the audience have anything? Yeah. 
Okay. People Statisticians are going to have a field day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sensing do. a theme. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I saw a hand up here. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, uh, there are people with microphones for you. Uh, for Dr. Green, two quick ones. Um, one, um, the study that you cited that showed that six months out there wasn't much difference between the two groups, right, uh, in terms of financial costs. Um, if this is predictive over sort of the course of a lifetime, um, the, the real numbers are going to be later on, aren't they? I mean, that you wouldn't expect too much change within six months, would you? So yes, absolutely. And in fact, that was MedSeq data. In our BabySeq data, we are seeing an increase in healthcare spending after sequencing. But I show that slide only because it's almost been an article of faith. Uh, there have been many, many perspectives and editorials written that, whoa, don't go too fast on sequencing because it's going to explode healthcare costs. So I, I was just kind of comparing that initial finding. But you're absolutely right. Over time, you would expect people with higher risk to get more diagnostics, to get more surveillance. And they and would, more treatment, they would, presumably. And the question really isn't whether it costs more. Everything costs more in medicine when you apply it. The question is whether there is sufficient value and payoff for that cost that it would be worth the money to society. Which leads to the second question, which is fairly obvious, which is if you have that degree of, inf of new information, uh, do we have the treatments, the preventions, the, it, it, can we do anything with that information that really does that patient uh, real long-term good? Yes, in, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. And it's constantly evolving. And you know what? Learning you're at risk is a great motivator. Um, I, I, I like to pull out the example of uh, Sergey Brin, who learned from his genetics that he was carrying a, a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Now, there, when he learned this eight years ago, there wasn't a treatment, and there still isn't a treatment to prevent it. Do you know what he's done? He's put $2 million into research, and they have promulgated additional research. So. I don't know, that's not treatment, that's not prevention, but it is action. And so there are a lot of people in this sort of information, data happy world that uh, aren't, aren't only asking the question, can I as an individual stop this right now in 2018? They're asking, how does this information change my life? How does it change how I interact with clinical trials? How does it change how I support research? How does it change my engagement with advocacy? And how does it change everything uh, in terms of, of my future? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, for those folks who sort of get a clean test result that says uh, you don't have these troublesome things, do we have any evidence on whether they engage in riskier behavior? <laughs> this, is, this is the question of false reassurance. If you find that you're, if Jay finds that he's at low risk for type 2 diabetes, does he immediately reach for the jelly donuts? Is there a jelly donut effect? And the answer, as best we can tell, is no. We've looked at that with some smoking cessation studies and some, uh, some questions about people who found they were at lower risk for breast cancer. Did they then go less to their regular surveillance? We've been unable to find any data for uh, false reassurance. It's an excellent question. It's also one of those questions like cost that gets thrown up like chafe uh, in the face of this kind of progress. Yes. Hi, um, I have a question. So if someone is at a higher risk based on the sequencing, is there any uh, concern around insurance companies saying, well, now you're predetermined for a higher risk, so therefore we're not going to cover? Because that always happens uh, with certain things. So I'm wondering if that's now, been looked into. Dominic, do you want to take a start at this, and I'll run out of it? You have actually had yourself sequenced. Were you concerned about that? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think. Um, they don't have any right to seize my sequence, right? So right. are they going to have some ability to, to know I've been sequenced or to get that? Of course, there's their privacy concerns. I think if you're worried about privacy concerns, there are probably you know, 25 things above that that would worry me personally. <laughs> um, the, um, I do, I have heard though, and I, I know we have health insurance experts in the room, I have heard though that the state regulatory boards are way behind on this issue and that uh, we need a much better regime than we currently have. So I think it's a very legitimate question. I mean, I think like, for example, some folks um, who want to get like short-term disability, if they have a pre-existing conditions or deny that. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that, you know, to kind of think about as we move forward. I, I love the idea, but there are also sort of consequences in the way that insurance companies look at things. 
Right, and well, you know, I got a, I got a, a CPAP test. What do you call these things? You, you do the som somnogram, whatever. And because my CPAP score was a certain level, I didn't have sleep apnea. But just being a little bit higher than that, my life insurance went up, premium went up. So, I mean, there, there are lots of little things like that. Yeah. And as most of you know, there is a federal law, Gina, that protects you against health care insurance discrimination and employer discrimination, but does not protect you against life insurance disability or long-term care. So those, I can tell you those insurance companies are actively looking at the degree to which as more of you get sequenced or genetically tested and know more about your risks, they want to avoid adverse selection by making sure they know what you know. And frankly, that's a legitimate economic argument. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, great, great day overall. Um, I'm a pediatric nephrologist at Boston Children's, and I deal a little bit with the genetics. Um, I'm, I was just concerned with a, a study that came out from England maybe two weeks ago about the rate of uh, rise in suicide among people with newly diagnosed cancer, even though now cancer has a much better um, treatment plan. And I wonder if uh, there is um, any studies with the people who get themselves sequenced and uh, realize that they're going to get, um, you know, highly prone for cancer, uh, because that's one of the things that you alluded to with uh, depression. Um, whether uh, the uh, there is control for the associated rate of uh, negative intervention, not only positive intervention. You mean when people get a risk variant for a future disease, then yes. they, they may have distress or even suicide? Well, because it was shown that in people who yeah. get like new cancer. diagnosed, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a significant raise in, uh, right. rise in rate of suicide. And as for the action that you were alluding to with the breast cancer, uh, there is a very well uh, uh, glamorized uh, and use when Angelina Jolie realized her uh, BRCA2 positivity uh, went uh, around and had a double mastectomy right. uh, preventively. So I think the issues are really serious and uh, they are, um, they relate also to maybe to the previous panel, you know, how do you behave with the jelly donut great, kind of great thing. Great point, yeah. Um, so these were so the numbers. Angelina Jolie is like a Rorschach uh, of this uh, whole issue because depending on you know how you see that, you can read that in so many ways. And because the reaction to a BRCA1 mutation for breast and ovarian cancer is so emotionally laden when you're thinking about uh, surgery like that. But um, just to answer your question directly, there is uh, no evidence that I'm aware of of increased suicidality among people who are at risk for but do not yet have diseases like cancer and heart disease, but who have learned of that risk through genetic testing. Um, there is, and of course it's a very different issue. If you have the disease, you have cancer, versus if you're told you have a percentile chance of getting it. Did you guys have any, any, anything you'd like to add to that, that concern about, we're, we, Dominic, I won't ask you what you learned in front of an audience from your genome, but were you concerned, did you go through the mental exercise of learning, of imagining you learned you were at cancer risk, and did you sort of try to figure out how you would feel about that? No, there are two markers. My um, grandfather died of colon cancer, and my grandmother died of Alzheimer's. And so there were, there were markers, pretty clear markers for both of those things, and I was interested to see if I had them. And I kind of thought that I would have them, so I went in with that expectation and was then sort of pleasantly surprised that I didn't. So on some level, it worked out the opposite of what I was kind of expecting. But you know, a lot of these things, especially anyone who's done 23andMe knows this, it'll say, oh, you have a higher genetic predisposition to this disease, which means that the average person has a 4% chance, and you're up at 6%. Right. And on some level, what do you really do with that information? It's right. not like it's black and white, the sorts of, of information you get from this. And that's, that's right. To me, that's one of the big learnings of the genomic revolution, that Okay, you have your genome sequence, but then there's your the bacteria in your gut, and there's the metabolome, and all these other things that that are at least as significant. So that's right. It's it's it's, it's ironic that the power of genomics, as we learn about it, means that it's not quite as powerful. Um, while following up on that, um, Mr. Williams over here, you also put your hand up that you had gotten sequenced. Did did you have concerns? 
that you would find something like a cancer predisposition or heart disease predisposition. Did you think about that? Did you anticipate that? Did you almost say no because you felt you wouldn't be able to handle that? Or did that no. not go through your mind? Uh, well, as I mentioned to you when we discussed it, I was part of a group of people. And it was interesting to me that in the group, it was the physicians who were most concerned about actually taking the test and what they would learn. Because the test provided progressive levels of, of disclosure, meaning you want to know everything. You don't want to know if it relates to your nervous system or different components of, of, of health. In my case, I want to know everything about everything. <laughs> and uh, because I'm curious and I felt that uh, if I learned something, I would use time differently and think about uh, life on a daily basis differently. Right. And while the microphone is down here, Howard, may, may I ask you, you know, hearing all this, uh, would you like to change the state regulations around genetic testing in New York? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> so we're, we, we are looking at all this. I mean, I'd like to follow up on the question about, that you asked about the insurance issues, because that is a big issue here. And, and I'm curious, the Human Genome Project sort of said you can't ask, or, or the, I wouldn't say the project, but they said that you can't ask about discrimination based on this. But what if you put on a form, an insurance form, that said, have you had your genome tested? That's not asking what it showed, right? And then if they ask the follow-up question, was there anything of concern to you, right? So that's like a lawyer asking a question right. in, in that way. Right. And, and not disclosing anything, but just asking. And then somewhere in some insurance company, they're saying, OK, well, they said they were worried about something. Now you've got a problem. I think that that's the, the part that makes people nervous. In regards to the state, yeah, Absolutely. we are looking at this issue. Uh, are you talking about health screening. insurance or life insurance? Uh, health, well, oh. health insurance, but life insurance also. I didn't think about yeah. that part. Yeah. Health insurance, absolutely. They, uh, they, they're not supposed to, this, you know, Obamacare sort of completed the circle. And with Obamacare and uh, absence of, of bias on prior uh, risks, they're not supposed to be able to do that. And then genetic testing kind of fit into that. But as you, dis, as you disassemble Obamacare, you get back in, you back into the question of whether they can bias against you. That's right. And as far as, as, far as um, uh, life insurance, they can ask you right now, not only did you get it, but what did it find? Right now they can ask you. They just aren't doing so because they're afraid of the public uh, reaction. But they can at any time, and they probably will. I've been talking to CEOs of some major uh, life insurance companies about this and whether they would uh, be willing to adopt uh, what's called a concordance, like they did in the United Kingdom, where they agreed not to weigh this in underwriting below a certain level, which was pretty high, 500,000 uh, pounds. Yes, sir. I'll just say that if you're on Facebook, they can figure out your credit score. And I've been told by people who work in insurance that they could also do brilliant adverse selection just by looking at your Facebook page if you had one. Right. <laughs> but you know, it's not a done deal. Life insurance companies have, have um, do not underwrite on the basis of uh, race or ethnicity because we would consider that to be socially abhorrent. So if we made it socially abhorrent for life insurance companies to underwrite on the basis of genetics or other kinds of risks, Facebook, whatever, we could force them through regulation not to do so, and they would probably survive. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'd like to extend the conversation about the, the effects on insurance to uh, beyond what is protecting the individual and what's protecting the insurance company or even what's in tech, uh, protecting the rights and interests of the employer to, to what's protecting the rights of society. And what I'm thinking, I'm involved in space travel. What I'm thinking about is if we go and commit to sending astronauts to, to, this, to Mars, we want to have people who are going to be in good shape physically and mentally for the whole three plus year, uh, year mission. To what extent, I'd like the, pa the panel's reaction, to what extent must they be se uh, sequencing? Should that be factored in to their, uh, to, to their selection? Do we as a society have the right to say, you may not go because I don't want to risk billions of dollars on, on you as a result of this sequencing? Great, and you could extend that argument into the military, into public bus drivers, into pilots, would you want somebody flying your domestic airline that had a known mutation for sudden cardiac death? A ask yourself that while we, while we, 
Yes. Um, I believe they did studies on the twin astronauts. People here may know this better than me. I think it may have even been an MIT technology review, but one of the things they found was these two guys have the same DNA, mm. but the one who went up in space, it actually changed how that DNA was expressed. So on some level, genomics only takes you, again, part of the way to understanding what the real impacts of space travel are. But, but Ernst, if we really th think about this beyond genomics, think about it in terms of wearables, in terms of cognition, in terms of 100 different variables, how does a statistician create some sort of model for occupational success or failure out of this? And is it fair to try to do that at the space explorer level, the military level, even the regular employee level? Should you be a statistics professor if you don't happen to have a certain constitutional bias toward being good with numbers? Should you be allowed to be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or should we just I, let I, social I, Darwinism I, sort, sort yeah, it out? The statistics gene. You know, I, I think, first of all, we ought to be a little bit humble about just how precise our statistical methods are and how much we really uh, can predict. Uh, I think we're an awful long way away from the sort of uh, precision that would generate some of these ethical questions. Now, the people at Netflix would disagree with you. Hmm. No, I mean, seriously, Facebook, Netflix, this is their business model, right? Yeah. They, they are saying they can predict what exactly what you want and what you need. They're not that good. They're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. OK, other comments and questions? Yes, sir, in the back with the blue shirt. Oh, it's huge. It's the major reason they think that a lot of the things, that they can't get strong enough signals from the genomic sequencing. So, I mean, you can't throw a rock from where we're sitting without, you know, hitting 100 companies that are doing really deep sequencing analysis of cancers, for instance. And what's striking and what shocks a lot of the sort of data enthusiasts and techno, you know, you know what do you call them, evangelicals, is that you can't find patterns there. There really are not patterns there that they've been able to find so far. And they think the biggest reason for that is because if you only look at the genes and you look at the outcomes, you're missing this huge piece in between. And you know, to the point I just told about the, the astronauts, they don't really understand all that well how DNA gets expressed. And so there's a huge sort of very functional you know, understanding of the mechanism that they still need for. And proteomics falls into that, but there's also a whole bunch of other you know, sort of omics. Exactly. But that, that's probably the next frontier of medicine, right? And that goes back to my original point, that you don't want to kill that by <laughs> what's funding that? The sales on Keytruda, right? Because the, you know, all these combination therapies and, and the next generation, so. Yeah, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people, I mean, you talked, somebody talked about telomeres earlier. You've got people who can, oh, I think it was, I think Howard mentioned them. You've got people who are selling tel telomere shortening therapies uh, to rich people. Uh, which without any scientific evidence whatsoever. And um, so there's all sorts of abuse of the notion of new technologies along with legitimate excitement and promise. Uh, and that's true for epigenetics, for telomere shortening, for nutrition, for all sorts of things. We've got time for one more question. Well, I think, I think we need to wrap it oh, up. Yeah, I'm, I'm so I'm we'll wrap gonna... up now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Robert. Thank you.